What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the channel. My name is Michael, and I hope you are having a fabulous day. Continuing with the Napoleon series, this time it's Napoleon Smashes Prussia, Jena, 1806. Super excited to check this out. Really, really cool learning more and more about Napoleon. I screwed up in the beginning, and I watched the Battle of Waterloo, 1815. It was my first video. Should have gone back in time, but that's okay. You guys corrected me, and you guys have been asking for Napoleon. So guess what? Napoleon it is. Drop a like, subscribe, let's go. History March collaboration, supported by our sponsor, The Great Courses Plus. The music. In December 1805, at the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French, won a crushing victory against the joint forces of Austria and Russia. Napoleon now dominated Europe, able to hand out spoils as he saw fit. In February 1806, he sent an army led by Marshal Massena to overthrow the King of Naples, who had dared to side with his enemies, and gave his throne to his own brother Joseph instead. Must be nice. Another brother, Louis, was made King of Holland. His German allies, Bavaria and Württemberg, were elevated to the status of kingdoms. While Napoleon made himself protector of the Confederation of the Rhine, a new alliance of German states that would contribute 60,000 troops to his army. In recognition of the new reality, Emperor Francis of Austria formally dissolved the Holy Roman Empire, founded by Charlemagne a thousand years before, but now without influence or purpose. Wow, that's crazy. Austria had been humiliated. France remained at war with Britain, Sweden, and Russia. But in the summer of 1806, all eyes were on Prussia. Hmm, now the question is that I ask you guys, is based off your knowledge of Napoleon going on, would you say that Napoleon was a monster, or Napoleon was more so countercultural to the monarchies and royalty that we saw? You know, one of the cool things that I, I touch about in several of the videos is seeing the geological or the geographical differences of the maps as, you know, the kingdoms progress. You know, like Prussia. Prussia, I believe, early 1900s, you know, became obsolete and then the German Empire came in, um, you know, or the off the top of my head, I forget the, the other term they call for it. But it, it's really that's the question that I'm going to pose because, you know, we're having this Queen Louise of Prussia saying that he's a monster, but is he really a monster or is he just against the regime? The Prussian king, Frederick William III, regarded Napoleon with deep mistrust and had been about to join the coalition against him when news arrived of its disastrous defeat at Austerlitz. He was heavily influenced by his wife, the celebrated and popular Queen Louise, who detested France and Napoleon. She led the influential war party at the Prussian court. Hmm. Matters came to a head over Hanover, a German state which had belonged to British King George III, been occupied by the French and given by Napoleon to Prussia as compensation for other territorial changes. Now, the Prussians learned that Napoleon had secretly offered to give Hanover back to Britain in exchange for peace. Wow. Frederick's advisers now persuaded him that war was the only honorable course. But Prussia then made a basic strategic blunder, sending an ultimatum to Napoleon without consulting its new allies in the Fourth Coalition. Their forces were too far away to help Prussia who would now face Napoleon's Grande Armée with just the small state of Saxony for support. Wow. Impatience. Hmm. In 18... You know, time and time again, we see that as the impatience of a monarchy ultimately leading to their defeat because they're impatient instead of simply saying hey we're going to accept this you know we're going to lose this battle to win the war type mentality and it's interesting to see that prussia is not waiting for the allies especially in a time when it's extremely crucial you had this newfound you know emperor he has a very powerful army 
do you really want to take him one-on-one -on -one when you just suffered defeats? You know, it's just... 6, the Prussian army had a fearsome reputation that dated back 50 years to the reign of Frederick the Great. Napoleon, a student of history, regarded it with respect. But Prussia's army had been allowed to rest on its laurels. Mm -hmm. Its generals were old. Its staff work hindered by bureaucracy and personal rivalries. Its movements ponderous and predictable. Prussian soldiers, however, could be relied on to fight with pride and determination, while Prussian cavalry was regarded as amongst the best in Europe. In October 1806, hmm. Napoleon invaded Saxony with an army of 166,000 men wow. and 256 guns. It's a big army. Advancing in three columns, the French crossed the mountain forests of the Thuringerwald, along roads carefully reconnoitred by scouts and spies. Napoleon intended to threaten Leipzig and force a decisive battle with the Prussian army, which he believed was near Gera. The Prussians were, in fact, further west, concentrating near Erfurt, on the west bank of the river Saale. Its commander, the Duke of Brunswick, had hoped to threaten the flank of Napoleon's advance. Oh, wow. But wrong-footed by the speed of the French, he now ordered a retreat north to find a new defensive line. Wow, he got outflanked. On the 10th of October, at Saalfeld, Marshal Land's Five Corps clashed with a wow. Prussian advance guard, commanded by Prince Louis Frederick, the king's cousin. The Prussian force was routed, and Prince Louis himself killed in combat with a quartermaster of the French 10th Hussars. Three days later, Lan made contact with a large Prussian force near Jena, and sent news to Napoleon. The French Emperor, believing he'd found the main Prussian army, rapidly issued orders for his corps to concentrate for battle at Jena. Bernadotte's one corps and Davout's three corps were to cross the Sala and fall on the Prussian flank from the north. But Napoleon was wrong. Lan faced a 35,000 strong Prussian rearguard, commanded by General Hohenlohe. Yeah, I was going to say. The main Prussian army, 52,000 men under the Duke. Yeah, he cut it short, you know, right up here. That's, oh my gosh. I mean, especially in times when, you know, communication, reliable intelligence is so important and it's extremely hard to get reliable intelligence. You know, this is 220 years ago. But still, I mean, it'll interesting to see how this blunder plays out because, I mean, he is be, about to be out. Duke of Brunswick was further north, moving straight into the path of Davout's yeah. three corps. The Battle of Jena began at 6.30 a.m. on the 14th of October, in thick fog. Marshal Land's Five Corps already had a toehold on the plateau west of the town and river. Wow. His first task was to drive back the Prussians and win room for the rest of the French army, arriving by the hour to deploy. His infantry led the way, and fierce fighting broke out for the villages of Cospeda, Krosowitz and Lutzeroda. Meanwhile, Augereau's 7 Corps advanced through a ravine, emerging onto the plateau hmm. on Land's left flank, while Sult's 4 Corps Just... climbed steep tracks to form on his right. Napoleon joined Lan in the center of the battlefield. Yeah, he's almost getting funneled in, which we're seeing right now as like a funnel is developing. Hmm. Maybe like push in, expand. Organizing out. a twenty-five gun battery to support the attack like on Bretzen Heiligen. Like the village was won, but then lost to a determined Prussian counterattack. On the right, around ten AM, 
Sult's infantry secured Klosowitz, but was counterattacked on its right flank near Rudigan. Mm. I mean, the craziest thing about we're seeing in these battles that take you know took place centuries ago is the fact of how fast the battles actually last. You know, we're at 10 o'clock. The battle started at about 6.30, so we're three and a half hours in, and quite a bit has gone on. You know, I spent a lot of, of today just reading up several other battles of more modern wars, and the battles that last for months and months and months, and we're seeing basically conflicts last in a matter of six, seven hours just because it's hand-to-hand -hand combat. Just a decisive charge by Salt's light cavalry oh drove off the Prussians, routing their infantry and capturing two enemy colors. As six corps began to arrive on the plateau, its fearless but impetuous commander, Marshal Ney, ignored orders and dived into the fighting around Wurzenheiligen, becoming briefly cut off by a Prussian counterattack and having to be rescued by guard cavalry. General Hohenlohe was expecting the arrival of 15,000 more troops under mm. General Ruschel at any moment. Until then, he remained largely inactive, shoring up his line and ordering limited counterattacks. But he had run out of time. Napoleon had begun the day with just 25,000 men. By 12.30, a steady stream of reinforcements had brought his strength up to 96,000. Wow, that's a steady stream. As the Emperor rode past the Imperial Guard, <laughs> one young soldier, eager to be sent into action, called out, forward Napoleon stopped and demanded to know who had spoken then rebuked the soldier as a beardless youth who ought not to offer advice until he too had commanded in 30 battles <laughs> but the moment had arrived although the guard to its frustration remained in reserve the other French corps were ordered forward in a general attack wow. the Prussian army began to give ground at first, it kept its discipline, but then disintegrated into a general rout. Murat's cavalry were launched in pursuit, riding down and sabering hundreds of fleeing Prussians. General Ruchel's two divisions finally arrived at the worst possible moment. They briefly held up five corps' advance, but were soon outflanked, broken up by cannon fire, and charged down by French cuirassiers. Meanwhile, so I mean, so far in this battle, it looks more so that strategically Napoleon didn't really have the biggest advantage. You know, we could say it's on par, but the fact that his troops were just better trained you know they were talking about how the prussians had a very well trained army back in the day but they were becoming a little bit lazy and napoleon's army is extremely well trained you know in the beginning it kind of looked like it was a bad setup for napoleon but i mean right now we're seeing him retreat and then the fact that he has a small you know amount of, re of reinforcements of seventy thousand adds to the picture really just i mean it's just making this battle almost seem effortless right now. 12 miles to the north near Auerstadt, marshal davu was marching southwest expecting to fall on the prussian left wing at jena instead he encountered the duke of brunswick's main prussian army heading north to take up new positions davu's three corps 27,000 men and 48 guns was about to face odds of two to one. While Bernadotte's one corps, which had orders to support Davu, was nowhere to be seen. Oh my gosh. Davu, nicknamed the Iron Marshal, showed no signs of alarm. He formed his first division into a defensive line centered on the village of Hassenhausen. His infantry forming squares to repel a series of cavalry charges by General Blücher's advance guard. His other two infantry divisions arrived to strengthen the line, standing firm in the face of repeated Prussian attacks. Wow. But Prussian movements were slow and poorly coordinated. 
nor did they use their numerical advantage to try and outflank Davout. Yeah. At a crucial moment, the Duke of Brunswick was shot through the eyes, a wound that proved fatal. King Frederick William himself took command. Several Prussian units remained uncommitted, but the king, convinced he faced the main French army under Napoleon, dithered. Around 1215, Marshal Davout counterattacked. The Prussian army turned and fled. Well. Davout had won a stunning victory against the odds, but at a heavy price. His corps suffered 25% casualties, one man in four killed or wounded, while inflicting twice as many losses on the Prussians. When news reached Napoleon that Marshal Davout had engaged and defeated the main Prussian army, he reacted first with disbelief, then heaped praise upon the Iron Marshal, later awarding him the title Duke of Auerstadt. Marshal Bernadotte, in contrast, was nearly court-martialed for failing to support Davout. Napoleon's army began a masterful pursuit of the beaten Prussians, giving them no time to regather their strength. Two weeks after the twin battles of Jena Auerstadt, Napoleon's troops, led by Davout's heroic Three Corps, entered Berlin. The next day, General Hohenlohe wow. surrendered at Prenzlau. At Lübeck, General Blücher and 20,000 Prussians were driven out of the city in heavy fighting and forced to surrender. While 25,000 Prussians, besieged at Magdeburg, surrendered to Marshal Ney. Russia's army had been devastated by a Napoleonic blitzkrieg. Wow. In just 33 days, Russia had lost 20,000 dead, 140,000 prisoners, 800 guns, and 250 standards. It was a humiliation that proud Prussians like General Blücher would neither forget nor forgive. Unlike Saxony... King I mean, seriously, what a tactical blunder. I mean, the main force of the armies up north, they get literally stunned and defeated by half the men. And look what happened after that. I mean, because they couldn't do that, Napoleon literally took over a huge chunk and he's still going strong like that's just that's unbelievable literally one tactical blunder right there just to re king frederick william refused oh to make peace with napoleon he continued to hold out in east prussia trusting in the approaching russian armies to rescue his kingdom wow despite another glorious victory for napoleon and the grande armee the war wow. was not won yet Napoleon Bonaparte was one of the greatest military commanders of all time. But who were some of the worst? Find out with the Great Courses Plus. That would be interesting to see who are some of the worst. But regardless of that, I mean, just seriously, Napoleon, I mean, this battle has to be the setting stone of a lot. I mean, he just expanded his territories quite you know, rapidly in a large volume of territory and land that he is now in control of. And the fact that the Prussians refused to surrender basically kind of, you know, it, it seems the fact that it forces the Russians to fight, defend their allies as well as Sweden to kind of see what's going on. But I mean, man, he absolutely steamrolled. And we see these tactics in World War One, or excuse me, World War Two, and Blitzkrieg and the effectiveness of it. And I mean, Napoleon, honestly, in the beginning, really lucked out. You know, strategically, it didn't look like he had a huge advantage, but his troops were just be well, better trained. It's crazy, you know, and it, it's really important. And it's nice to hear that Napoleon was a student of history because oftentimes history, once again, you're repeating and you can find out, you know, knowledge. And Napoleon basically just beat them with strategics based off their history, knew how they were going to fight. I mean, that's just, it's nuts. But anyways, Napoleon smashes Prussia. 
Let me know what you guys think about this video. Leave it in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe, turn on those bell notifications, stay tuned, and there's a lot more reaction videos coming your guys' way. And as always, stay healthy, stay happy, and have a blessed day. Peace.